we are back with module eight notes and today they're going to be coming from pages 255 and 256 in your textbook. The notes prior to this in module eight we covered in class. All right, so we are talking about just another reason to love the periodic table. It organizes atoms and elements based on its columns. And the columns, like we talked about in class, are called groups or families. We're gonna talk about those groups today. So first off, the periodic table helps us determine charges of atoms. When we're talking about charges of atoms, we mean a positive charge or a negative charge. When they reach their ideal electron configuration. And as we covered in class, the ideal electron configuration is when the atom's outer orbital is completely full of electrons. So in order to attain this ideal electron configuration, the atom wants to either lose some of its extra electrons or gain more electrons so that it has eight in its outer orbital. Group 1A. All of these elements behave the same. It's the first column in the periodic table. Group 1A has only one valence electron. So it'd be really easy for those atoms to just kick that one electron out and then their next lowest orbital would be full of eight electrons. So group 1A wants to lose one electron. After it loses its one electron, it would have one more proton now than it has electrons, leaving it with an overall charge of one plus. Okay, so these charges are after the atom reaches its ideal electron configuration. Group 2A has two valence electrons, so again, it's easiest for it to just lose those two electrons, give them up to another atom out there, um, so group 2A wants to lose two electrons. Once it loses those two valence electrons, it ends up with an overall charge of two plus. And remember, an atom that has a positive or negative charge is called an ion. Okay, so at this point, it has become an ion because it has a positive or negative charge. Group 3A, the metals in this group, those are the elements to the left of the jagged line. So we're talking about, in group 3A, we're talking about aluminum, Ga, In, and Tl. Those metals want to lose three electrons. If they lose three electrons, again, they'd have three more protons than they have electrons, so they have a three plus charge. So in these middle groups, there's a few exceptions. And as you can see in group 3A, boron is a nonmetal. It's in group 3A, but it's colored in red and it's to the right of the jagged line. So that nonmetal is gonna be an exception. You don't have to worry about it. It does not follow this rule. This rule for 3A is just for the metals. And we'll talk about what to do with the exceptions in just a minute. In group 4A, we switch from talking about metals to talking about nonmetals. So in group 4A, the nonmetals want to gain four electrons. They have four electrons, four valence electrons in their outermost orbital, and so they want to add four more to get a complete set of eight electrons in their outer orbital. Once they gain four electrons, they're going to have four more electrons, then they have protons, leaving them with an overall charge of four minus. Again, there are exceptions in this group. So like I said, in group 4A, now we're talking about the nonmetals, which would be carbon and silicone. That's how carbon and silicone be. The nonmetals want to gain four electrons. The other ones are exceptions. In group 5A, the nonmetals want to gain three electrons. When they do, they will have an overall charge of three minus. In group 6A, the nonmetals want to gain two electrons. When they do, they'll have an overall charge of two minus. I hope that you're getting it. 
the pattern here. Group 7a, the nonmetals want to gain just one electron because they already have seven valence electrons, so they just need one more. When they gain that one extra electron, they will have a one minus charge. And then group 8a, of course, are the noble gases over here on the far right. They already have a full valence or outermost, outermost orbital. So they are completely satisfied with their eight electrons filling up their outermost orbital. All this information can be found on page 255. I just kind of condensed it into these notes for you. Okay? Once you have determined the charges that the atoms will take on when they have their ideal electron configuration, um, you can determine how those atoms are going to bond to other atoms to form compounds. Because an atom that has a one plus charge is going to be attracted, for example, to really any of these atoms that have a negative charge. Okay, so on the bottom of page 255 are some rules that you follow in order to determine chemical formulas between two different types of atoms. We're going to write those rules down. If the charges have the same numerical value, if the charges have the same numerical value, for example, one is two plus and one is two minus, they cancel each other out. So the subscript, the subscripts cancel each other out, they're both equal to one, and can be ignored. Because remember, chemists can never be bothered to include that little one subscript at the bottom. They just ignore it, okay? We will go over an example of this in just a moment if it's not quite making sense yet. Okay, the other rule, if the charges have different numerical values, if the charges, we're talking about two different ions, if the charges have different numerical values, you drop the plus and minus signs, drop the plus and minus signs, switch the numbers, switch the numbers and use as subscripts and use as subscripts. Okay, so this rule is talking about if you have an ion that has a two plus charge, it would be, connect, it would be attracted to any of these ions with a negative charge, right? Because positive and negative charges attract. So if there was an atom, an ion nearby with a three minus charge, they would be connected, they would be attracted to each other. They would be able to connect, form a compound or a molecule. And this is telling you how you would write the formula. Let's do an example to show exactly uh, what this rule means. So I need to erase this a moment. Turn the page to page 255 for the examples there. Sorry, to page 256. So on page 256, there's example 8.2. It says, what is the chemical formula for the ionic compound? Do you remember what an ionic compound is? It's a compound formed by a nonmetal and a metal. Um, formed by aluminum and sulfur. What is its name? Okay, so we have to figure out 
the formula for the compound of aluminum and sulfur. Okay, so the first thing we want to do is see where they are in the periodic table. Aluminum is in column 3A and it is a metal. And like we wrote down in our notes, in column 3A, metals want to lose three electrons. So if aluminum loses three electrons, it's going to have three more protons than it does electrons, so it's going to have an overall charge of three plus. So we're going to write in its charge. Aluminum would normally have a three plus charge. Okay, now let's find silicone. Silicone is over on the right in column 6A. And for column 6A, we know that uh, these atoms become ions with a two minus charge because they like to gain two extra electrons, okay? Let me just show you on the periodic table. This is, these atoms become plus one, plus two, some become plus three, and then we start going down. Four minus, three minus, two minus, one minus, and then the noble gases are neutral, okay? So you kind of count up, one, two, three, and then four minus, three minus, two minus, one minus. Okay, uh, so these two would follow that second rule we wrote down. When there are atoms or ions, actually they have charges now, when there are ions with different charges. So what we do is, it said we take away the plus and minus charges, we switch the numbers and use them as subscripts. So really, you just bring the three over here, you bring the two over here, so the compound would be Al2S3. Ta-da, that is the formula. And it would be called aluminum sulfide because negative ions get that I-D-E suffix. Okay, let's do another. The next one is barium oxide. The next example asks us for the chemical formula for barium oxide. So barium is B-A and it is in column 2A, so it's gonna have a one plus, two plus charge. Two plus oxide is short for oxygen. Oxygen is in the one plus, two plus, three plus, four minus, three minus, two minus. It's in the two minus column. So oxygen has a two minus charge. See how these numbers are the same so they cancel each other out? So, your formula would be BAO. You could imagine a little one down here after the BA and a little one down here after the O, but chemists don't write subscripts when it's just one. So it's BAO. And the last example here is what compound forms between Na and N, sodium and nitrogen. So sodium is in column 1A, so it has a one plus charge. Nitrogen is in column 5A, so it has 1 plus, 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 minus, 3 minus. Nitrogen has a 3 minus charge, so we just flip-flop these two numbers, and our formula would be Na3N, and that would be sodium, sodium nitride would be the compound that is formed. All right, so I hope that makes sense. Make sure that you do the reading on your own and bring any questions to class or email me. Thanks.